Hi there, Smart Drivers. Rick with Smart Drive Test talking to you tonight about automotive uh, technology and its kind of advances through the 100 years, 120 years now almost, uh, from the inception of the motor car at the beginning of the 20th century up until now in uh, 2020. And uh, just bear with me here just a sec. I'm just going to crank up the contrast a little bit because my video, unfortunately, always looks different <laughs> on YouTube than what it does on my screen which is a little bit uh, unfortunate there we go so save and now we'll see how it goes all right so we look good now uh, contrast is up a little bit so bricks for wheels is here thanks very much bricks for wheels is the moderator he gets the videos for people does a really good job at looking uh, after people in terms of getting the videos when that I talk about when we're doing it uh, blessed is here Aloha thank you so much uh, Garave is here. Gar Garave. There, I believe I said it right. Thank you so much. So if you have any questions at all, I'll be more than happy to help you out. But uh, without further ado, we're going to launch right into the technological, uh, uh, the technology that sort of improved uh, safety in terms of driving vehicles. And not only that, but also had an impact on how we drive. And probably the first um, automotive uh, piece of automotive technology, the advancements in uh, automobiles was the electric starter. Oddly enough, the electric starter was probably one of the first advancements on automobiles. Uh, it was invented in 1912 by a gentleman named Charles Keatering, and it was based on the electric cash register. So when you hit total, the cash drawer would come out. It was the same idea as the electric starter because what you needed was you needed a gear that would engage when the motor started up the gear from the electric starter had to retract and the impact it had on driving and the widespread application of motor cars because you have to realize that in 1912 not very many people had motor cars it was still very much the wealthy in society that had motor cars so what had happened was is the electric starter came in and it now allowed women to drive particularly because very much horses were the domain of men because you know it's hard to control a 1200 pound beast and so uh, the electric starter allowed women to drive cars because no longer did you have to have one of those cranks to start the vehicle unfortunately those cranks did persist well into the 1950s and into the 1960s and a lot of people sustained broken arms because of the vehicles backfiring and whatnot so that was the first technological advance in 1912 and it appeared on the Cadillac. So Janet's here, Beverly's Hill, parallel parking in three simple steps, please. <laughs> okay, uh, and Penny Penny is here. Good evening from the United States. So Beverly, parallel parking in three easy steps. So you need to pull up so the bumpers are in line with, so when you pull up to the car that you're gonna park behind, the bumpers are in line. Pick out your 45 degree angle and it's somewhere behind the post that comes down next to the driver's door there at the front. And you're gonna pick out your 45, you're gonna turn the steering wheel all the way to the right. You're gonna back up until you're facing your 45 degree angle. Back up until you're a third to halfway down the hood and then you're gonna crank the steering wheel all the way to the left and you're gonna back in until you're straight in the space and then move forward a little bit and stop. And that's how you're gonna do that. And Corey will get you the video on how to parallel park and it'll give you better explanation of that and how to do that. So there's, uh, Corey's already got the video for you. So Paul is here. Paul is working on his CDL license. Good evening. Hi there. And uh, yeah, so everybody else is here. So the next automotive advancement was hydraulic brakes into the 1920s was when we got hydraulic brakes. And uh, up until the late 1920s, for those of you who are not familiar with automotive history, uh, most of you have heard of the Model T, which was made famous by Henry Ford, who started to mass produce uh, the Model T in 1908. It went out of production in 1927. It sold for $895 in 1907. When it went out of production in 1927, it was now selling for $275. The other thing about the Model T was that by the time it went out of production in 1927, uh, it had uh, created a huge used car market. So lots of people could now afford cars. And that was why you had the prolific use of automobiles by the end of the 1930s. Of course, Henry Ford also became a, a millionaire, a billionaire by that point. 
by being able to mass produce the Model T, which was the tin lithium. We could talk about all kinds of things about that. But the interesting part about the Model T was well into the late 1920s, the brakes on these cars were still rods and linkages. They weren't hydraulic brakes. And it was something that Henry Ford reluctant, reluctantly came to later on uh, because he felt that hydraulic brakes were just not reliable. So that was something in the late 1920s that was adapted to car cars was hydraulic brakes. But brakes were not really seen as reliable until well into the 1960s when we had the division of front and rear brakes, the division of the system into two subsystems. So if one failed, the other would continue to work uh, normally. So that's what finally made brakes reliable. So Laura is here. Jim is here. Thanks so much for that, Jim. Yes, good video on parallel parking. It, went, it was the first video that I had that went past a million views just recently. We had a great celebration about that. Uh, Beverly just passed your test. Awesome. That's really great. And uh, awesome. And Jim is here. Paul is here. So if you have any questions at all, just interrupt me. So the first automotive uh, advancement was the electric starter in 1912 appeared on the Cadillac and allowed women to drive. Sam is here. And Sam is uh, Big Mac Sam, driving lessons by Big Mac Sam. He is at in uh, Rookie Auto Driving School in Bronx in New York. So if you are looking for driving lessons in that area of the world, uh, look up Sam by all means. And Sam, I noticed that you had a live feed this afternoon. How did your how'd your live feed go, Sam? How did it work out? Sorry, I didn't catch it. I was <laughs> taking trying to take the day off today and went to the beach with my kids. It was one of those perfect days of the beach where it was too hot to sit on the beach for too long and it was very cool going in the water so it was one of those awesome days at the beach this afternoon i suspect that's where a lot of other people are too so a <laughs> really great day all right so on to the late 1940s the next automotive advancement of course there were other things that were going on in the late 1920s and 1930s of course the world was in disarray at that point because we had the world depression we had the first world war uh it wasn't until uh, the late 1940s that we had the next advancement in automotive technology and that was the automatic transmission and uh, the automatic transmission obviously allowed a lot more people to drive because the manual transmissions at the early part of the 20th century most of them were non synchromesh transmissions they were much more difficult to drive than synchromesh transmissions because synchromesh transmissions are much more forgiving than non synchromesh transmissions so uh, you have to match the speed, the gear, and the engine speed in order to shift a non-synchromesh transmission. As well, most of these early non-synchromesh transmissions were three in the tree. So they, what they, the shifter was actually on the column on an H pattern. It was really kind of weird. So yeah, that's uh, that was the next thing. So the automotive uh, automatic transmission was the next advancement that allowed a lot more people to be able to drive motor cars. And this was around the same time when, when uh, General Motors came up with sort of the five different classes of vehicles that were very much targeted towards uh, particular socioeconomic groups within society. So the Buick, the Pontiac, uh, Chevrolet, and of course the Cadillac, which was the top car. If you drove a Cadillac in the 1950s, 1960s, and early 70s, you really kind of made a statement about who you were in society. So there we go. So that was number three was the automatic transmission. So uh, it was a bit choppy, was testing it out. So that's that's great, Sam. I, I know for a fact that some of my first live feeds were not very good. It wasn't until I updated my, uh, updated my internet to a much faster connection and got a much better computer that could actually process all of the data that you need to stream out uh, does it get a little bit better. So unfortunately, you know, it does take a little bit more uh, oomph in terms of computer technology and internet connection and those types of things. So, uh, um, good evening. I'm doing well. And yourself, Penny, hand over hand, really important in my state. I can do pull and push method, but it's not acceptable. Can you put a video about hand over hand? Yes, I can, Penny. Uh, Corey will find that for you about how to steer. And there it is right there. Corey's got it up for you. So that's excellent. Uh, for everyone, hello, I'm planning to take my G2 test. I'm eligible to take G. What do you recommend? Uh, if you're eligible to take your G, do your G, your G rather, because uh, no point doing an extra test if you can do your G. Um, just do. Can you do that? Do you have to take your G2 first, or can you go right to your G? I'm not sure about the, that the, that parameter in Ontario. I need to look that up for you, uh, for everyone. Uh, just have a look at that, okay? Okay, King, you asked me that question today about why I oversteer. I don't oversteer, uh, King. 
Uh, it may look that way, but most turns in most vehicles, you're only going to turn the steering wheel a half a turn. If you have a look at that, you're going to see that the, the steering wheel probably doesn't turn more than half a tier, half a turn. It may look that way in the video, but I'm definitely not oversteering. Uh, I'm probably steering enough to get the vehicle around the corner. Okay, so yeah, thanks, Sam. Okay, Laura, uh, what is your suggestion driving at night? I would like to drive at night on the highway when there's less vehicles. Uh, Laura, definitely, I don't know if you've already seen the video on uh, night driving and the tips that I put forward for you. Now, one of the things you need to keep in mind, Laura, is, is that the farther you get away from urban areas, the more you have to rely on your headlights. And so you're going to have to find other markers all along the roadway that are going to, going to help you to locate where the roadway is and especially if you're driving on highways. So highways are pretty good in terms of reflectors, signs along the roadways, uh, reflectors down the center and reflective uh, paint markings on the roadway because there's glass in the paint that they use to paint the road markings on the roadway and those will reflect some of the light back to you to allow you to find the roadway. The other thing to do, Laura, especially if you're driving through wooded areas, is to look up at the skyline and oftentimes you can see the cut of the trees through, this, through the, the bush that will allow you to uh, see where the road is going to go because that's going to be your biggest challenge at night is finding where the road actually goes. So that's what you need to do. And uh, also with night driving, know that other vehicles are going to drive on the roadway. So follow other traffic and look far down the road. And especially at this time of the year, I should mention this in terms of animals on the roadway because I just took a trip last week down to Vancouver Island, which is five hours from here. And we had a deer run out from the side of the road. And uh, I need to look at my dash cam to see whether I got it on my dash cam or not. But uh, just, one of the things I suggest when you're driving at night to avoid animals is to have another car in front of you that you know that if there's animals there, that car is going to get them off the road before you get there. So that's just have a look out for that as well. And then definitely have a look at that video. Okay. Okay. So there you go. For everyone, uh, you can go directly to G. I can skip G2. So if you can go directly to G, I would suggest and counsel you to go directly for G. Skip a road test. Why would you do another road test when you can go right to G, get the whole thing done, and get on with your life? You just need a bit more practice. You need to be very smooth on the controls for G because they're expecting that you had some experience and you had some practice in terms of driving. So just go right for your G. Do the work that you need to do. Have all the slow speed maneuvers in place. Be ready for all of that. Be ready for your... Uh, reverse stall parking, two point reverse turn, three point turn, your parallel parking, just be ready for all of that and practice as much as you can between now and your test and go right for your gene. Just get it out of the way and get it done. Okay, Sam, uh, are you recognized when you are out in public? I was just wondering. I was recognized three times at a road test site. Uh, yes, uh, Sam, I am a little bit now that I'm on YouTube. Uh, uh, not of late, but a uh, a couple of few months ago, I was on the ferry coming back from uh, Vancouver Island, coming back home, and I had a woman come up to me and she asked me if I was Rick August, and I said, yeah, she was, and she's just like so excited that she met me and she passed a road test there in Vancouver, one of the suburbs of Vancouver in Surrey, I believe it was, and she was so happy. I had another woman downtown meet me one day. I was in a restaurant. She came up to me and started talking to me, so yeah, I'm starting <laughs> to get recognized, which is, which is a little bit, you know... You know, you start having a YouTube channel, but you don't really think that people are going to recognize you when you're out and about, but it does happen for sure. All right. Uh, Jim, do you know how long you have to wait to take G test? I went to driving school and I just got my license at the end of June. Uh, I believe, uh, Jim, I think it's two years from the time that you get, uh, from the time you get your N, not your N, from the time that you get your L, to the time that you can take your G, I think you have to have a two year period. I could be wrong in that, but the place to look for that gym would be on the MTO website. They'll be able to tell you that because I believe you, I'm pretty sure you're in Ontario. Okay, there we go. Uh, King, yeah, I'm confused because when you turn right, it seems like you turn the steering wheel twice sometimes instead of once. Yeah, no, King, uh, for sure. Uh, when I'm turning the steering wheel, it's only half a turn when I'm turning that. Can you explain more about road markings, especially when you are the only one on the road, Ella? Uh, Ella, in Ontario, there's two kinds of road markings. There's white road markings and yellow road markings. White road markings separate traffic going in the same direction. Yellow road markings separate traffic going in opposite directions. 
If you have a single solid yellow line down the road, it separates traffic going in opposite directions and you can pass with caution. Only if you have a double solid yellow line does it prohibit you from passing on that section of roadway. Uh, don't cross over solid white lines. They're usually found at intersections and near crosswalks. You can't change lanes on solid white lines, okay? So that's, those are kind of a bit fundamental of road markings. Uh, the other place is to make sure that you look in uh, the driver's manual for your state or province where you're taking your road test. Uh, Stove Master, Stove Nasty, keep up your hard work. You're the best. Thank you so much for that. That's really great. For everyone, thank you so much. Your videos are really helping. I'm really glad that they're helping out and you for sure will get your G license. We'll help you out with that, okay? Uh, Stove Nasty, my man Rick, be honest. Have you ever tried to eat a Big Mac while driving stick? I mean, people can... <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, I can't say I have. Uh, I don't. I don't frequent McDonald's very much. Uh, Chris, I'm going to take my driver's test next month, but I need to do a five-hour driver's course first. Can you tell me what the five-hour course is about? Uh, Chris, where are you in the world that you're taking your road test? Where are you taking it? All right, there we go. Okay, so we got up to automatic transmissions. Now, interesting enough, in terms of advances it's in automotive technology, so we're up to, what are we up to? We're up to number four, number four. Okay, so between the late 1940s with the invention of the automatic transmission in the early 1980s, there wasn't an advancement in automotive technology, which might surprise some of you, uh, other than tires. that we, went, we had an invention of radial tires in that 40-year period. But between the automatic transmission and the advent of uh, electronic fuel injection in the early 1980s, we really didn't have an advancement and automotive manufacturers kept uh, repackaging the same thing year after year after year. I mean, they got kind of creative with the bodies and pointy lights and those types of things, but there wasn't an automotive advancement in the 40 years other than tires. We went from bias ply tires to radial tires. And some of you probably don't know what the old bias ply tires were, but they were pretty crappy tires. Uh, it wasn't unusual to have a flat like every week because of bias ply tires. They were unstable and those types of things. So, uh, yeah, when we went to radial tires and we got much better tires and much better handling and suspensions and those types of things on automobiles, uh, that was kind of the number four was the tires to steel belted radial tires as we got much better tires. So that's number four. And then I'm going to talk about number five. And number five is a series of things because I'm going to talk about safety that happened kind of in the 1960s a little bit. But I'll answer a couple more questions here. Uh, okay, so King, uh, can you explain how you get used to a car that's steering wheel doesn't turn, uh, doesn't turn automatically back? Uh, King, the reason that your steering wheel is not turning automatically back is because you're not going fast enough. If you go a little bit faster, the steering wheel will automatically spin back unless unless you've got bad tires and you don't have power steering on it. But most vehicles, if you're going fast enough, if you go a little bit farther faster, so when you get halfway through the corner, start to accelerate out of it and the steering wheel will spin back, okay? So Chris is in upstate New York. Okay, so Chris, just let me remind myself of the question that you asked me. Uh, five hour driving course. Okay, so Sam is here. Sam, what is that about that Chris has to take a five hour driving course? He's in upstate New York. Uh, what is, what do you know, can you add anything to that Sam about what he has to do? Okay, Penny, uh, my instructor is really strict. I wish you were my instructor, but anyways, you were really helpful, thanks. Well, I'm glad that we can help you out, Penny, and I do apologize for your instructor being really strict. And you know, unfortunately, some of them are not flexible in their teaching and, and that sort of thing, so that's unfortunate. Okay, Isabel, hey, Dr. Rick, your videos are very helpful, thanks. I took my road test a week ago, but I failed because I did not yield the right of way to a pedestrian who was one lane away from me. Yeah, unfortunately, sorry about that, Isabel, I really unfortunate. But you know, with a little bit more practice, we're confident that you're gonna get it next time. You got a good attitude and you're, you're back here and you're learning what you did wrong. And there's actually a video here on that specific thing that you need to have one lane buffer and maybe Corey can, can find it for you. I haven't, I don't have it off the top of my head. It was one of my early videos about that you need one lane of space between you and a pedestrian and the reason for that. So if, you, if you're turning right onto two lanes, the pedestrian has to reach the center of the roadway before you proceed because you want that one lane of space between you and the pedestrian as a buffer. Uh, <laughs> King, you should honestly just have a whole live stream to answer questions. And yes, King, that's pretty much what I do every week on Sundays or Mondays is I answer 
just answer questions for people uh, going for the road test. And that was that was the reason that this whole thing got started uh, with the live streams was is that I was trying to help uh, students out who were going for a road test who had questions for me and then I could answer questions for you. And you know, now I just kind of filled it in with some of this other interesting stuff with the automotive technology stuff that I'm doing here. So uh, yeah, so I think we got all of that. Corey might be able to find that video, video for you, Isabella. And uh, Sebastian, should you wait for the oil change prompt or your vehicle to light up before going for an oil change or should you just go out and do it? Uh, Sebastian, good question on maintenance of your vehicle. Uh, most vehicles, Sebastian, should have an oil change every 3,000 miles or 5,000 kilometers. And no, do not wait for the light to come on. That's a misnomer. If that engine oil light comes on on your vehicle, get the vehicle pulled over to the side of the road and turn it off as quickly as possible. I know that some of the newer high-end vehicles do have a low oil light on them, but most of the cars that you and I are going to be driving do not have a low oil light on them. You actually physically have to pull the dipstick and you should pull the dipstick every couple of weeks to check the oil on it. If you do have one of those higher end vehicles that you do have an engine oil light on and it tells you that it's low, yes, add oil to it. But keep track of the oil uh, and change the oil on a regular basis that will help to maintain and prolong the life of your vehicle. And as I said again, every 3,000 miles, every 5,000 kilometers, change your oil. And again, there's a video here and I think Corey, Corey has actually put it up here. Uh, yes, how to change your oil. So there's the video that Corey's put up there for you, okay? So, uh, Sebastian driving, yes. Okay, perfect. Um, Isabella, you're awesome. And space between your vehicle and pedestrians. There you go. And Corey's got the video up for you, Isabella. That's really great. And okay, so Sam says the five hour pre licensing course must be taken before taking a road test. It's actually a class a person must attend with an instructor talking about rules of the road, work zones, safety, drinking and driving, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So it's, I, it's a classroom that gives you the theory of all of the road rules, drinking and driving, safety, general rules, and those types of things for new drivers. And that's what that's about, Chris, is what you have to do. So it's a five hour course, so there you go. So Sam is actually in New York State. He's in the Bronx, but that's what the five hour course is about. And I wasn't aware that you had to take that in New York State. So that's what the five hour course is about that you're gonna be doing. All right, uh, driving the effects of drugs and driving videos are shown in the class and students are involved in questions and answers. So there you go. It's basically a driver ed course that you have to be involved in prior to taking a road test. Okay, so number five in terms of automotive advancements are a bunch of safety features that came about in the 1960s. And most of these safety features came about because of Ralph Nader. Yes, the former candidate for US president wrote a book in the 1970s called Unsafe at Any Speed. And it essentially took aim at a vehicle called the Chevrolet Corvair. And what was happening was that the Chevrolet Corvair people were drivers and vehicle occupants were dying in this vehicle in crashes that they otherwise should have survived. One of the biggest things that killed people in the Chevrolet Corvair was that the steering column, if a vehicle hit the Chevrolet Corvair on the front corner, it would push the steering column into the occupant's cabin. Oftentimes it would catch the driver under the neck and break their neck and kill them in a, in a very low speed crash. So that was the first thing. Other things that happened inside the vehicle were that young children were not restrained because remember we didn't really have seatbelt use until well into the 1990s. So people were not wearing seatbelts. Uh, oftentimes young children would go forward and there were big knobs on the dash and those types of things and they would lose eyes or sustain injuries because of the impact of them going into the dashboard. So that was another thing that happened. Uh, and because of that book, Unsafe at Any Speed, a lot uh, we began to learn about automotive safety and a lot of people were dying. And by the end of the 1960s, we had horrific traffic crash fatality numbers. Uh, in the United States of America, more people every year were dying in automobile crashes than the number of people who were killed during the entire Vietnam War. There were approximately 65,000 people a year just in the United States of America who were being killed by the end of the 1960s in automobile crashes. And so auto manufacturers sort of retaliated saying that nobody's ever going to buy safety. Nobody's going to buy safety features on a vehicle, which is kind of interesting <laughs> in this day and age when 
the first thing that people look at when they buy a vehicle is safety features and how safe the vehicle is in terms of uh, crash tests and those types of things. So it's a, it was an interesting period of time in terms of automotive safety. So the things that came out of that uh, unsafe at any speed that was written by Ralph Nader was breakaway steering columns, uh, tempered glass, and crumple zones. So if you so a good comparison of that, if you look at race races race cars in the 1960s when they get in a crash and they hit the wall or they hit another vehicle, you just see them and they just hit the other vehicle and they don't actually, nothing happens. The, the vehicle seems to be more or less intact. Unfortunately, the vehicle occupants sustain all of the energy and oftentimes do not survive the crash. Whereas today, if you watch car crashes, especially Formula One, and you see the car, crash, the car get into a crash, it looks like the car disintegrates. What those are are crumple zones on the vehicle that absorb the energy and in, and stop it from being transmitted into the cabin of the vehicle and stop it from being transferred to the vehicle occupants. And therefore, because there are crumple zones on the vehicle, vehicle occupants often survive the crashes. So this is this was the conflict and the battle that happened over the 1960s was safety features that were really. Uh, started with Ralph Nader's unsafe at any speed and out of that came breakaway steering columns, tempered glass, seat belts and crumple zones and then we you know brought in seat belt laws in the early 1960s. So that's sort of what happened in the 1960s. All right. There you go. So Sam has got more information on his YouTube channel there, so you can have a look at that for sure. Um Okay, there you go. Corey's got some other videos for you there. King to look at. King, I only have a month to learn how to drive and I'm about to start my seven driving lessons. Do you think it would be possible for me to be able to learn how to drive that fast? Yes, you can learn how to drive in a month, King, especially if you've already had some driving experience, which, which it looks like you have and you already started learning those types of things. And again, King, definitely have a look at that video that, that Corey's put up here on how to learn to drive a car to pass your road test first time. That There's some lessons in there. Uh, that will help you out. The two by four lesson, getting some of those 36 inch, one meter tall pylons and going to a parking lot and working with those. Because uh, King, the fundamentals of learning how to drive a car are really about the slow speed maneuvers. If you can do the slow speed maneuvers, you're gonna learn about how to uh, master the primary controls of the vehicle, the steering wheel, the throttle and the brake. You're gonna re learn where your vehicle is in space and place. And all of that is going to make you a better overall driver and prepare you for your road test. So just do a bit of work on your slow speed maneuvers and those types of things and you're going to be a better driver overall and it's going to help you out. All right. So uh, automotive advancement number six. We're up to number six. And as I said, between the late 1940s and early 1980s, there was really no automotive advancements there was some safety features that came about and those what I said were number five but number six is electronic fuel injection as far as I'm concerned electronic fuel injection was the greatest automotive advancement ever because it completely revolutionized the uh, internal combustion engine by eliminating the carburetor which was adequate at best in terms of the fuel air mixture to make the electronic uh, to make the petrol engine run but electronic fuel injection can compensate for elevation. It can also compensate for temperatures because uh, outside temperature can affect how well your vehicle runs. And carburetors couldn't do any of that. They couldn't adjust, they couldn't adapt to temperatures, they couldn't adapt to elevation, they couldn't change to different barometric pressures uh, in the environment. And I'll tell you, back in the days when we had carburetors, there's stories of people lighting fires under their car in the morning to heat up the oil pan to get the vehicle to start. They had to take the battery out of the engine compartment and take it inside to keep it warm to get the vehicle to start. Jump starting vehicles, all those types of things. I mean, now we're so spoiled with electronic fuel injection, you just go out in the morning and turn the key over. It can be minus 20 outside and the car will start right up. Uh, you can drive from sea level to 3,000 feet above sea level and the vehicle will still continue to run as if it, and nothing had changed. Not only that, we now have uh, VTEC engines, we have four-cylinder engines that are putting out 300 horsepower, 400 horsepower. All of this is due to electronic fuel injection and computers on cars. So electronic fuel injection, in my mind, is one of the greatest things that ever happened in terms of automotive advancement. So there you go. Uh, 
So that's number, that was number six. Uh, number seven, another advancement in automotive technology was ABS brakes, anti-lock braking systems. And uh, despite some disagreement about anti-lock braking systems at the beginning, uh, and I'm still a bit reluctant about ABS brakes because I, I kind of like standard brakes, but ABS brakes have avoided a lot of crashes and kept a lot of people alive because the purpose of ABS brakes is that they will not cause the vehicle to lock up because if the tires lock up, the vehicle will begin to go out of control. And a lot of new drivers especially don't know to release the brake pedal to get the, ve the, the wheel spinning again. ABS brakes do that automatically. So if you have ABS brakes on your vehicle and uh, you're in an emergency braking situation, you simply push as hard as you can on the brake pedal and hold and the technology will take care of allowing you to be able to steer the vehicle in an emergency situation and steer in the direction that you want to go. And I've talked a little bit about this in the crash analysis that I was doing at one point that many people get into a crash because they give up during the emergency situation. Never give up. Make sure you have your seatbelt on. That way you're going to stay in the seat. And as well, make sure that uh, you're looking where you want to go. Always looking for your out. Always made it, keeping it out because know that in an emergency situation, if you have space around your vehicle, it's faster to drive out of, out of, out of an emergency situation than it is to try and brake. So that's the other thing about keeping space around your vehicle. And this comes back to the fundamentals of defensive driving is, is that uh, as I always say, have space around your vehicle. If you have space around your vehicle, it's less likely that you're gonna hit something else. So that's what I talk about in terms of fundamentals. Now, the last thing that I'm gonna talk about, and this is just a bonus uh, piece of advancement, and this is an, this I see as a negative uh, automotive advancement. I don't see it as a positive at all in the way that I see these other things that have changed the way that we drive, have allowed women to drive with the electric starter in 1912. The automotive uh, automatic transmission which allowed a lot more people to drive automobiles because many people had so much trouble learning how to drive standard transmissions particularly non synchronous transmissions uh, you know safety features in the 1960s that came about because of Ralph Nader's book and uh, electronic fuel injection which just made cars so much more reliable than they were prior to you know that with carbur carbureted engines and whatnot so the last thing I, I want to talk about is telematics. And telematics are uh, portable communications in vehicles. It's now we have this big screen in the middle of the vehicle that has a backup camera in it, it has all our radio stations, it has all the information about the car, it has tire pressure, uh, it has um, other information that you want, GPS, tripometers, and those types of things. So there's a lot of information now on these telematic devices that I believe are incredibly distracting particularly for learner drivers that all of this information there's just simply too much information that is accessible to the driver while they're driving I mean why do I need to know what the tire pressure is while I'm going up and down the road I think it's just too much information so I feel that the adaption or the adoption rather and the fitting of telematics into newer vehicles is simply distracting drivers and contributing to the whole distracted driver thing that's going on with cell phones uh, not just cell phones but video devices and those types of things unfortunately I've seen videos here on YouTube with truck drivers driving down the road in the middle of the night with a video up in the corner there and they've got a watching a video while they're going down the road and I just you know I find that incredibly problematic so telematics I think are the bonus feature and I, I see them as very negative I do not see them as a positive automotive advancement at all so you can let me know what you think in the comments and for those of you watching on the replay as well let me know what you think in terms of telematics and distracted driving and how maybe we can begin to you know eliminate some of that problem that is now prolific amongst the driving public in our society and as well if you like the video give it a thumbs up and if you like what you see here on the channel as well consider subscribing and hitting that bell and that way you'll get instant notification when i get the videos up for you so yeah all right, so Sam says ABS brakes feel very weird when they come into play. Yes, indeed, they do. <laughs> they uh, grinding, shutter, pushback, all of that is normal with ABS brakes. And Sam, when I take new students out in a car, that's one of the lessons that I actually uh, have them 
that I put forward is activate the ABS brakes. I get them out and I get them up to 40 or 30, 40 kilometers an hour, 30 miles an hour, and I get them to apply the brakes as hard as they can and actually activate the ABS so they know what it feels like because it's very strange the first time, especially uh, here in Canada where we get snow and ice and, and they'll that ABS will activate very quickly on snow and ice because of course you get wheel lock up at a very low speed so that you know what they feel like. Uh, Chronic passed my G2 Ontario road test first try because of this man. Rick, thank you so much for that. Congratulations on passing your road test. That is awesome. Uh, and just leave us a comment there and I'll put you on the map of success. I'll make sure I get that done for you. So King, how do you know when I'm turning whether to just turn the wheel upside down or turn it a little bit more than that? Okay, King. So what I would suggest to you is, is that you need to go out and get some of those 36 inch one meter tall pylons and you need to put them in a parking lot and you need to work on working with the steering wheel going around the pylons and backing up and reversing. Uh, I would suggest to you that you're not ready yet to be out on the roadway and turning the vehicle because when you're turning, how much you turn the steering wheel is not, it's not static. For some corners you're going to have to turn a little bit more than on other corners and for different corners you're gonna to have to turn a little bit less so what I would suggest to you is to go into a parking lot and work with those 36 inch one meter tall pylons and get a bit crazy with it have a lot of throttle and go screaming around the corners and then back up and turn the steering wheel and get used to how the vehicle feels because you don't want to be trying to figure that out on the roadway with other traffic you want to figure that out how much to manipulate the steering wheel in a closed circuit uh, area where you're not dealing with other traffic because you don't want to be worrying about what other traffic is doing. That working and manipulating the steering wheel, the throttle and the brake, all of that should be second nature for you before you get out on the roadway and start dealing with other traffic. Master the primary controls first in a closed environment. Get used to that. It's not going to take you very long. It's probably going to take you an hour, maybe two hours of backing up, going around corners, doing figure eights, back reverse figure eights and those types of things. Have a look at all the exercises in that video and then once you master that and you're comfortable with the primary controls then I would suggest you to go out and work on the roadway but if you're still trying to figure out how far you need to turn the steering wheel I would counsel you that you're not quite ready yet to be out on the roadway do some other work first before you get to that okay okay uh Sorry, Sebastian, what is that? They have a blind spot uh, distraction. That's scary. Okay, I'm not, I didn't quite follow that comment. There's probably something missing there, Sebastian. Uh, okay, for everyone here in Toronto and Mississauga, most people do not follow the speed limit. You're right about that <laughs> for everyone. People don't follow the speed limit. Uh, as I've talked about, after getting your license, most people... Uh, will keep up with the traffic flow and most of the time the traffic flow is going to be 10 to 20 kilometers an hour more than what the posted speed limit is so know that uh, and I talk a little bit about that in terms of um, social driving okay that's part of social driving is, is that the traffic flow is going to be higher than what the posted speed limit is so know that as well okay blessed when I took my road test I had to parallel park but you took the comment away <laughs> okay Sebastian they already have blind spots now distraction that's troubling uh, you mean blind spot lights Sebastian is that what you're talking about actually I find the blind spot lights uh, very helpful when there's a car up beside you that's in the blind spot but if you have a vehicle that does have a blind spot light on it or some sort of indicator uh, because I've been in vehicles where they're on the mirror or it's right up uh, at the bottom of the post on the driver's side there I find those quite good uh, because they'll help you know that there's vehicles there but it is not a reason to stop shoulder checking make sure that you're shoulder checking anytime you're making turns or moving the vehicle laterally or those types of things so uh, know all of that uh, that you need to continue to observe well because observation is part and parcel of continuing to drive crash free and being safe on the roadway all about vehicles hey how's it going I haven't uh, seen you for a little bit there you've been away so it's really great that you could drop in tonight and say, hey, howdy, how's it going? Awesome. Uh, how to learn how to determine blind spots around your vehicle. There we go. So there's a video on that. I did have that buried, but the blind spots are fairly significant around your vehicles, especially to the, the back of the vehicle. 
Okay, King, any tips on parallel parking? Yes, uh, King, when, they, when you go for your road test, they're not gonna make you, it's unlikely, I'm not gonna say it's not a certainty, but they're only gonna make you parallel park behind one car. They're not actually gonna make you park between two vehicles. So know that for the purposes of your road test that you're only gonna have to park behind one vehicle. And there's a video here on parallel parking. Actually, Corey will put up the entire playlist for you because I don't know whether you'll be parallel parking behind another vehicle or will you be parking uh, between cones. So there's a video here on parallel parking. Thanks, Keenan. I appreciate that. And how is how are things going for you for the summer, Keenan? Are you having a good summer? I forget where you are too in the world. <laughs> My apologies. Uh, it has been a crazy summer for me. Uh, yeah, I've been off doing something else. So, all right. All right, so just go over the automotive advancements that I was talking about. So number one was the electric starter. Number two was hydraulic brakes in the late 1920s. And as I said, Henry Ford was reluctant to put hydraulic brakes on vehicles because he saw them as uh, unreliable. So he hung on to linkages and rods for the longest time to put brakes on motor cars. So the hydraulic brakes came on uh, and they were not reliable well into the late 1960s or early 1970s when uh, braking systems were divided into two subsystems. And this influenced an entire generation of drivers and is continuing to influence drivers today with manual transmissions that they still think that they have to shift down to save the brakes. And there's a video here, Corey will get it up for you on why you don't need to downshift in a manual transmission to slow the vehicle for the purposes of slowing the vehicle and basically my fundamental point in that my base basic point in that video is is that why would you use a fifteen thousand dollar drivetrain to save four hundred dollar brakes just push in the clutch and use the brakes the brakes are reliable and will not fail and that's the reason why we used to downshift because well into the 1960s brakes on cars were not reliable so that was number two hydraulic brakes number three was the automatic transmission which allowed a lot more people to drive vehicles uh, number four was radial tires, uh, steel belted ra radial tires, which came about in the mid 1960s and switched from bias plies, which, which were not reliable at all. A lot of people learned how to change tires because of bias ply tires. Uh, number five was safety equipment in the 1960s, spawned, spurred on by Ralph Nader's unsafe at any speed, were breakaway steering columns, tempered glass, seat belts, and crumple zones. Those were safety features that came about in the 1970s, or 60s rather. Number six was electronic fuel injection, which came out in the early 1980s. And then number seven was ABS brakes, which allow you to brake and maintain steering control. And then finally, the last one that I said was the bonus one was telematics. And I saw this as a negative automotive advancement because unfortunately it leads to distraction of drivers in motor cars. So those are the uh, seven and a bonus automotive advancements through the 20th century and into the 21st century. And then of course, uh, we're running out of time here because <laughs> we can have a whole uh, session on autom autonomous vehicles that are supposed to be coming about and according to uh, the pundits and other people, uh, Elon Musk and whatnot, that by 2020 they're going to be on the market and readily, readily available. But I think they need to do a bit of work if they're going to have that happen in the next 18 months. Alright, so uh, there we go. Okay, so Keenan, Tara... Um, there you go, da Kron uh, Kronik, uh, aced the three point video, watching the video, that's really great, glad we could help out. Okay, Keenan, it's fine thinking about getting a 2008 Ford Escape or Mazda Tribute V6 all wheel drive as my first vehicle, I have a G1 now, I'm from Toronto. Yes, in Toronto, there we go, Keenan. And uh, I, m I might suggest the Mazda. The Ma I, I would probably, Keenan, my personal thing would be to tend to lean towards the Mazda. And maybe some other smart drivers have some opinions about the Mazda or the Ford Escape, uh, that vintage as far as the 2008. But personally, I like the Mazda because it's a V6 and it's all-wheel drive. Those are kind of my two things. And also, I like Mazda, so that's it. Okay, so there we go. Uh, Sebastian, I'm commenting on the... Te technological advancements on trucks. You dressed as car driver. I know truck drivers have large blind spots. Yes, they do. They have enormous blind spots, Sebastian. I mean, you do learn to compensate for those with our backup cameras, 
convex mirrors and bus mirrors. If they have good mirrors on them, the, the blind spots aren't so bad, but obviously the larger the vehicle, the more blind spots you're gonna have on these vehicles and any technology that we can put in place is certainly going to help uh, drivers be able to drive these vehicles better. However, again, I come back to telematics and GPS units in these larger vehicles. It can be distracting for drivers. So drivers need to be aware of these and need to put in place uh, strategies and techniques that they're not going to be looking at those pieces of information while they're going up and down the road because it, it could potentially lead to a crash. Uh, yeah, Sebastian. <laughs> yes, and think about that. Also think about the fact that uh, many of these truck drivers are uh, working long hours. They're driving many, many miles in a day. Uh, so, you know, they can be in any sort of given state. I mean, as a, as a whole, the trucking industry, the busing industry, and other people who drive large vehicles are professional drivers and do a really good job of it. Unfortunately, there are some of them out there who are not doing a good job of it and are allowing themselves to be distracted and those types of things are not using hands-free devices and whatnot. And I would suggest to anybody who's driving a car, uh, driving a truck or whatnot, get a hands-free device, something that allows you to talk on your cell phone, to use your cell phone, voice to text and all those types of things that are gonna minimize the amount of distracted driving. Because I know that there isn't, there's no way, you're not, you're not going to eliminate distracted driving. It's just not gonna happen. But we can do the best we can by putting strategies and techniques in place. If you can't leave your phone alone and you don't have hands free in your vehicle, then put your phone in the trunk or put it away from you where you can't get a hold of it. That's going to be one of the ways that you can reduce distracted driving. All right, uh, Keenan, okay, the same vehicles, whether you want an escape or tribute, and both of them can be had in V6 all wheel drive or front wheel drive or a four cylinder. Yeah, down to taste. I think I think my taste, Keenan, would be just the Mazda because I just I I just I don't know. I think it I think it's got a little more reliability. Uh, have you looked up reviews for those two vehicles, Keenan? Because uh, that would be my other suggestion. Look at the reviews for the two different vehicles, and then that might give you another uh, point of reference in terms of deciding which one you're going to buy. JFSA 380 technology upgrades on trucks uh, really can't stand the collision avoidance or adaptive crews. They'll slam the brakes on or prohibit you from passing. It helps sometimes, but it's just irritating. Uh, yeah, yeah. I the collision avoidance I think would bother me too as well, and the adaptive crews. I have used adaptive crews, and one of the things that I do not like about adaptive crews because it has those sensors on the front of the vehicle. Uh, as you're coming up on a vehicle, it will automatically slow you down. And oftentimes, JFSA 380, in my experience, is that when I'm on cruise control and I'm on a multi-lane road, when I come up behind another vehicle, I'm waiting for a vehicle to just get past me and move over, and I don't want my vehicle to slow down because, as you and I know, in big trucks and larger vehicles, you get a fair bit of momentum built up, and when the adaptive cruise automatically slows you down, you get over into the other lane, it takes a lot longer to get the vehicle back up to speed again. So that adaptive cruise can be somewhat irritating. <laughs> I know exactly what you're talking about in terms of advancements. So those are some advancements that have a negative side effect and they haven't yet figured them out yet. So it is something that we can definitely work on and whatnot. So, so yeah, so we're rolling up to 45 minutes here. I think we're going to keep, uh, we're going to leave this here. And uh, we talked a little bit about some of the automotive advancements. We can talk more about those. Uh, again, if you're watching on the replay, definitely consider giving it a thumbs up. If you're new to the channel, uh, consider subscribing if you like what you see here. And if you have any questions about your road test, uh, leave me a comment down in the comment section. I'll be more than happy to help you out with all of that. And uh, congratulations to everybody who's passed a road test in the last week or so. And for those of you coming up on a road test, good luck on your road test. All the best with that. And I'll say good night. And uh, remember, pick the best answer, not necessarily the right answer. Have a great night. Bye now.